And I am so privileged to be here with uh, some of the esteemed, some of the authors, very esteemed authors of our textbook. Unfortunately, some of the authors couldn't make it, but who we have today, um, and I'll start as you appear on my screen. We have Dr. Angela Stanton, um, and Dr. Angela Stanton is a PhD neuroeconomist who evaluates the changes in behavior, chronic pain, decision-making as a result of hormonal variations in the brain. Her current research is focused on migraine cause prevention and treatment without the use of medicines. Um, as a migrainer, migrainer herself, uh, her discovery has helped was helped by experimenting on herself and she's found the root cause to be at an ionic level so she has written the chapter she um has put so much uh science backed information into this chapter she has a community that she serves so she practices what she preaches uh, a, a very warm welcome to you dr angela stanton Thank you very much. I'm very, I'm very happy to be pleasant. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Amy, uh, sorry, we have Amy Berger. Amy Berger is a U.S. Air Force veteran and a certified nutrition specialist who specializes in using low carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition to help people reclaim their vitality. She blogs, you might have read uh, from her, um, her space called Tuit Nutrition, where she writes about a wide range of health and nutrition related topics, such as insulin, metabolism, weight loss, thyroid function. She's an international uh, speaker on low carb and ketogenic nutrition. So many of you may know her already, so no introduction required. But for those of you who don't, please look her up. Um, she has also authored peer-reviewed journal articles, and she's author of the Alzheimer's Antidote, and of course, author in the section of the textbook. Welcome, Amy, and it's very lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be part of this, of this textbook project. Thank you. And then Dr. Georgia Ede is um, MD. She's a Harvard-trained board-certified psychiatrist. She's based in Northampton, Massachusetts. She specializes in, um, in mental health and nutritional psychiatry. With 18 years of clinical experience in hospitals, community health centers, specialty clinics, private practices, She's also served as a staff psychiatrist and nutrition consultant for seven years at Harvard University Health Services and for five years at Smith College in Western Massachusetts. Th thank you so much. Sorry, the screen just changed there. Thanks, Georgia, for joining us. Uh, and very, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. And then we've got Dr. Lori Rash. Dr. Lori is an adjunct senior lecturer at the Department of Human Biology at UCT, University of Cape Town. He's both an undergraduate and at the postgraduate level. He co-supervises MSc and PhD students in research project, projects ranging from relational health, weight, weight loss, sleep and spinal cord injury. And he makes use of techniques such as functional MRI, cardiovascular function, heart rate variability, and cognitive function as well as EEG. He has a particular interest in autonomic nervous system and more than a decade of academic research. And he also has a personal history of traumatic brain injury, which I think underpins all of this amazing um, research. So such a great honor to have you here, Laurie. Well, thanks very much for uh, that awesome introduction. I'm so, so happy to be here to share my story as well as my science. Thank you. Awesome. So this section of the textbook is something that is so very important to me as a specialist physician. I have done my time um, in various specialities in the Alzheimer's unit, doing hours and hours of testing um, in the memory clinic, um, treating patients with migraine, um, even consulting on patients with traumatic brain injury. And often it is the area that physicians we, we, we reach a sense of hopelessness. There isn't hope that you can give um, to your patient. Um, and what a fantastic um, panel we have here and authors to give actual clinical cases and hope 
of being able to treat these otherwise thought of as progressive chronic um, debilitating illnesses using nutrition. Um, and so I, that, that's the reason that I'm so absolutely excited that what we know and what we've been listening to and attending all the lectures and conferences over the years that is finally um, sort of authenticated and peer-reviewed and backed by science and anybody who's interested now has access to this textbook. So I'm going to start with a question to each of you. If you could say why this textbook is so important um, in your clinical fields, in the fields in which you work, how has uh, the knowledge of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction impacted the way that you practice? And therefore, why is this, um, this textbook so important that, uh, that, that it gets out there to, to medical students, to uh, physicians? I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Georgia. It's really groundbreaking. I mean, up until now, we've had uh, we've had a kind of a piecemeal approach to the science. You know, people specializing in their little silos of you know low carb for obesity or low carb for diabetes or low carb for for uh, for Alzheimer's, low carb for uh, for uh, uh, various different types of of conditions. But to put all of the science in one place and to have such an incredible uh, like a wealth of knowledge from, from experienced clinicians as, and researchers uh, right there, first written, written firsthand by all of these experts is, that's never been done before. And, and to have all the information in one place so that if a colleague questions me about, you know, uh, what, what, what's the scientific ground that you're standing on when you're using these interventions with your patients, I can say, here's a textbook on this very subject. And you know, there's, something, there's something about a textbook uh, which just lends the field so much more credibility. And because it's been, it's not just been written by experts with deep experience and knowledge, but it's also been uh, reviewed by academic editors to make sure that everything is really uh, airtight in terms of the references and, and the science and not, not kind of overstepping our bounds or in really being being responsible and careful with what we know and what we don't know, being clear about what we know, what we don't know, where does the science currently stand? Uh, in a very in a very responsible way, so that people in academia and people in and and people in the clinical world, it's it's written in a language that they understand and 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 I think will appreciate. So and it just gives us so much more, uh, so much more of a solid footing when we're using these in clinical practice, but also when we're recommending these to skeptical fellow clinicians. Thanks so much, Georgia. I love what you said that it's the the authors have had to be very responsible, um, and it gives us that confidence to be able to prescribe and treat our our patients when we've got the backing of all of these clinicians and experts from all around the world. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Angela. What okay. is you? Yeah. So just to add to what Dr. Uh, Georgia Ede already said is that. Uh, most people, as in my experience, think of the low carb and ketogenic diets as a weight loss tool and nothing else. And I think that in addition to authenticating all of our work and putting it out there in a um, in a form that people cannot say, okay, so it exists, um, they can also see that it isn't for weight loss. In fact, in many cases, it may even be for weight gain because it sort of kind of takes the person to the optimal level. And I think it changes what people see. It changes the formula of what the ketogenic diet and the low carb in general is. Thank you. I love that because as you say, most people think of it as a fad diet and nobody, you know, um, except for epilepsy that it was seen as therapeutics. It's still seen as one of the fad diets. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Angela. Uh, Dr. Laurie, what, do you, what is your take on this textbook? Well, I mean, I do read papers for a living, so it's just refreshing for me to have a textbook where it's all dished up for you, kind of. You normally, you have to search out and make sure it's like a reputable source, and then, but it's very, very little on diet. I mean, I, myself, I mean, I, I don't really study diet, but my own personal story, and I'll bring that in. I actually, after, because I had a very severe traumatic brain injury, and I had to kind of, and Angela with the headaches, I mean, that are related to, and, and just to see it all in one place, and I've actually learned so much myself just going through the chapters now and it's 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 really absolutely like brilliant to put it all in 
in, in, in the textbook and just bring it together as as uh, George also was saying, it's just, yeah, it just makes such, it adds so much to the field. Thanks so much, Larry. Amy? Yeah, like, uh, like everyone else has already said, I think what this really does is grant the ketogenic diet more legitimacy than it had, more scientific legitimacy. I mean, all of us, we know this works. We see it every day. Most of us have experienced it personally in our own bodies and our own brains. But it's it's difficult to convince other, you know, like Georgia said, skeptical professionals. And, and this what this book is going to do is make it unquestionable that there is absolute legitimate science behind this. There's legitimate biochemistry and physiology. This is not wishful thinking or, you know, it's all well and good to read a blog article about somebody who did keto. But this is um, something that I, I just think it's it's going to grant it just a lot more scientific credibility and and if 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 this could be used in medical schools or in continued training and real quick one one thing that i think helps the book too is that each chapter had to be relatively brief you know just with the with the editorial guidelines so it gives you just enough to understand what the rationale is for a ketogenic therapy in a specific situation. And then for, for anyone that wants to learn more, they can just look at the references and go to those. So it's like just enough to tell you what, 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 what is the scientific basis for the use of keto in this particular circumstance. Awesome. I love what you say. And as an author myself, um, you know, you never ever want to hear back from the editors with a list of things that you have to explain or make more concise. Um, so, you know, I had to do that as, as an editor, but I want to thank the eagle-eyed editors um, on this textbook who came back in my uh, personal experience saying, can you explain this a little bit more? Because as, as it, it, when you're in the field, it makes sense to you. But when someone's reading it to understand and says, make it a little bit easier to understand, and you go back to the, that, that section months later and go, oh, this actually makes sense. In fact, I had an experience this weekend. I was uh, preparing, uh, so I wrote the section on metabolic syndrome. And as Laurie said, everything is in one place. And I started to do what I usually do, which is pull out articles. And then I was like, hang on, I've got the chapter. Let me just go back <laughs> to the chapter. <laughs> and it was just so much easier. <laughs> so I want to start with Alzheimer's. Um, Georgia, sorry, before we go to Alzheimer's, I just want to let the viewers know that the, there are a wide variety of topics that um, are covered in this textbook, and these are the authors that could join us today. But we've covered in the textbook amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, Parkinson's, mood disorders, autism spectrum disorder, multiple sclerosis, um, cerebrovascular diseases, including uh, the topics that we're covering today. And so I think Alzheimer's is somewhere I'd like to start because um, as a as a specialist physician myself, and having done time in the geriatric unit, and sitting for hours in um, the the memory clinic that we have here um, at our Watoshi Hospital, it's um, it's it's a life altering diagnosis, and it's it's a, the patient goes downhill very quickly, and of course the family is left to be the carers. Um, and of course, the genetic question of when will this, will this happen to me? When will this happen to me? And it really is, you know, you, there's only so much you can do with medicine, that with, with pharmaceuticals at the moment. So, of course, 35 million people um, are diagnosed uh, globally with um, Alzheimer's, as you both say in your section, and this is due to be to double by 2050. So we're sitting with a really big problem. And if we all know that the obesity epidemic is doing the same thing, and this word chronic progressive disease, we use it in diabetes. So I want to bring you in there, um, Dr. Georgia, to um, and you as well, Amy, you know, feel free to, to add. Um, it's seen as the chronic progressive, but Alzheimer's has has been coined uh, or terms of type three diabetes. It's known as type three diabetes. So what is the role of hyperinsulinemia in the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease? Shall we start there? 
Yeah, and and Amy, please jump jump in <laughs> uh, because uh, so so there is a in in terms of mental health, in terms of conditions that we think of as psychiatric, because uh, there there are brain conditions that are considered psychiatric, and there are brain conditions that are considered neurological. When in fact, of course, the brain isn't divided into neurology cells and psychiatry cells; it's one organ. And so, and we've known for over a hundred years that uh, ketogenic diets stabilize brain chemistry in the case of epilepsy, which is a, which is a, a brain chemistry illness. And so, um, so we have a tremendous amount of science to, to, to resonance. So what we understand about, about how, ins how high insulin levels, which largely come from a high sugar diet, if you're eating too much sugar, more than you can metabolize, then your insulin level, you'll need a lot more insulin to deal with all of that sugar. And so the more insulin you need, uh, the more pressure that puts on your insulin signaling system, and it can damage the insulin signaling system over time, which is a hormonal system and a very sophisticated one. So if you get too much insulin in your bloodstream, if you're eating too much sugar too often and your insulin levels are running too high too often, that will also cause uh, um, some, uh, some damage to your brain's ability to use insulin and, and, uh, to help the brain turn glucose or sugar, blood sugar into energy. So kind of it's counterintuitive, but the more sugar you eat, the harder it is for your brain to use sugar for energy. And so there's a slowly mounting brain energy crisis going on in the background over many, many years. Alzheimer's doesn't happen overnight. It happens over many years, decades, in fact. This your brain glucose processing is slowing down silently in the background for many, many years. So uh, if your brain can't generate enough energy, it will start to, it will literally start to shrink and cells will start to die. And, and that's, that's the fundamental problem with Alzheimer's disease is that the brain is dying. And so this is one of the, one of the primary drivers of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we know more about how high insulin levels lead to Alzheimer's disease than we do about how high insulin levels affect most other psychiatric conditions, things like depression and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and many other mental health conditions. We're just starting to learn how insulin resistance and high insulin levels lead to those problems because they play a major role we're learning. But with Alzheimer's disease, the research, um, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy because she she's very, very deeply steeped in this research and has written an entire book about the subject, um, that we that body of research is very mature. So we we that's where we, the people who have been studying Alzheimer's disease, they have some of the highest quality information available about how high insulin levels damage the brain's structure and function. Amy? Yeah, yeah, I, what can I add? Um I think that it's it's pretty well understood at this point that metabolic syndrome or chronic chronic hyperinsulinemia is an underlying driver of numerous things like type 2 diabetes, hypertension, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver. And it's almost like we, we pretend like the, the brain is immune to the rest of the problems that occur body-wide, system-wide, from chronically high insulin, we, we it's it's we we almost dismiss the mere possibility that that could be every bit as damaging to the brain as it is to the rest of the body, and um, I think it's it's um, th there's so much we don't know, right? There are still so many unanswered questions about Alzheimer's, but that doesn't mean that we don't know anything. And the the memory loss, the cognitive decline, the personality changes are the symptoms, that's not the disease. The disease is a brain fuel starvation problem. The brain is not getting enough fuel. And so the symptoms of that are memory loss and, and all of these other things that we see. And because we're, I, I think we see a failure of so many of the drugs because we're targeting those symptoms without without trying to target that underlying cause. Why is the brain starving for fuel? And what can we do about that? And um, I think um, 
just lost my train of thought, but, but like Georgia said, I want to reiterate that this, this is not something that develops overnight. You know, this is a metabolic problem that brews silently, you know, no symptoms for years and years and years. And then it progresses very quickly. But um, just, just to emphasize again, this is, the brain is not immune to all of the same types of problems that that happen when we have these metabolic disturbances. And um, people, people need to, for all the things we don't know about Alzheimer's, what we do know for certain is that the major problem is that the brain is not getting enough energy. So right. whatever so treatment, whatever treatment, whatever therapy is ever going to be effective has to address that. Absolutely. So it's the same thing that we're doing with the metabolic syndrome. Somebody comes in with obesity, we tell them to lose weight and restrict calories. Somebody comes in with diabetes and we put them on a pole to reduce the sugar. Somebody comes in with hypertension and we give them an additional pole. So that's exactly what we're doing. But Amy, all doctors associate um, Alzheimer's with the amyloid hypothesis. So for somebody who's listening, who's intrigued and wants to learn more, how do we address this new thinking, new new within inverted commas, because it's been there for a while, but how do we, how do we, what do we say now? So where does this amyloid come from and what's its role? Uh, Georgia, do you want to tackle that or, or should I start? Take it away. Uh, well, so, the first thing we can say is that every single pharmaceutical drug to date that has been developed to target the amyloid has been a failure. They have been successful in that they do reduce amyloid, but reducing the amyloid does nothing to improve the actual disease state or the presentation, it does nothing. So that should tell us right away that maybe the amyloid isn't the problem. And there's more and more research coming out and, and has been out for a while, suggesting that the amyloid is actually protective. We see increased amyloid also in traumatic brain injury and in other things that it may be um, released in, in response to neuronal stress. And so if it is protective, then reducing it is actually counterproductive. It could actually make Alzheimer's worse. And that is what we actually see in the clinical trials of these drugs, they get worse. And of course, reducing amyloid does nothing to address the fuel shortage in the brain. So um, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a terrible shame that so many millions upon millions of dollars and years of research efforts have been funneled toward that. And they're still, being funneled toward that while, while we're ignoring that, you know, 800 pound elephant in the room. Absolutely. So it's exactly what we're doing with diabetes, give more insulin or, or you know, pump, whichever, whichever means get more insulin to the body. Um, Georgia, did you want to add anything to that? Just that, I mean, and just to, to reinforce what Amy is saying is that and this happens over and over again in, in, in medicine throughout history. You know, we see some shiny object and we think, okay, there, there's something, there's something wrong here. Okay. We see this little clump of protein that, you know, it seems to be more people with Alzheimer's have this little, this clumping protein in their brain than people without Alzheimer's. Let's get rid of the clumping protein rather than, okay, why is that there in the first place? Why is that there? Let's understand it first before we start throwing billions of, of, of dollars in research and time and, and drugs, drugs, which damage the brain drugs, which these, some of these newer amyloid drugs, they, they cause the brain to leak. I mean, this is really, really, um, the, the lengths we will go to, <laughs> to try to, uh, kind of hammer down the problem. We don't even understand, uh, what's causing it in the first place. It's just so it, it's just like she was saying, it's a terrible shame. We know more about what causes Alzheimer's, the metabolic, the, the, the sort of glucose insulin problem with Alzheimer's. We know a tremendous amount about that. Why aren't we targeting that? And uh, we, 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 there's so much more evidence behind that than there is for this, for this amyloid, this amyloid issue. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the brain isn't stupid. The body isn't stupid. It does things for a reason. Why is it generating all of this amyloid? What's happening? So we have to get curious. If we, if we want to do something about the disease, we have to do something about it early because once you have it, it's even with a ketogenic diet, it's very difficult to turn it around. 
I mean, decades of damage are, it has already occurred. So I think just this is just one of the symptoms of the problem with our medical education system is we're not looking at root causes. And if we look at root causes, we have really hopeful, empowering options for people. Um, not as easy sometimes as taking a drug, but much more effective and much, much safer and, and, and virtually free. <laughs> and, and impacting the whole body, um, in effect. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Angela, I want to come uh, through to you now. So um, everybody who knows somebody with migraine, lift your hand up. You know, <laughs> we, we all, we all, we all know somebody. I've had friends, I have friends and colleagues, uh, such awesome uh, physicians, uh, but they they just knocked when it comes to that particular day, can't get out of bed or they drag themselves to work, you know, clutching their head and things like that. So Angela, you write in your chapter, in your section of the chapter that migraine is the third most common neurological condition, which affects 15% of the population, perhaps more, I, I, you know, perhaps there are some that are undiagnosed. Um, but you also write and have discovered that it is related to sodium handling. So can you explain to those who are intrigued, who either have this condition themselves or have a loved one or, or have a doctor who suffers <laughs> with this condition, um, can you explain what that means, that it is not about taking a pill or all of the lifestyle things that people do to, to, to control or to limit um, how is migraine related to the body's handling of sodium? Okay, that's a very, very important question. And I know it's coming just very weirdly to everybody and everybody says salt. What do we have to do with salt? But salt is uh, probably, uh, if I'm looking at our body and all the mineral contents, salt is probably the biggest in terms of minerals in our body. There's no cell without it. And it has a very important, actually many, very important physiological functions within each cell. And in the brain, very specifically, it has a role of operating it. If, if you look at how the brain functions from the very base, basic element, it requires energy for running the electricity. We are running with electrical currents in our brain. And uh, like with Alzheimer's, you need to have the energy to run the brain. That's the first step. But then once you're running the brain and you have your ATP, provided you do, then you need to have salt to run the, to start the action potential. And if for whatever reason, your brain has lower amount of salt than sodium uh, that it would need, it won't be able to start functioning. And basically migraine is caused by the not enough sodium in the brain. And we think of our body, well, it's one body. And so whatever is in the body is in the brain. So if I eat a very salty food, my brain should be fine, but it doesn't work that way. And migraine is a genetic condition um, in which the way the channels that operate, whether the sodium goes into the cell or coming out of the cell work differently. And so the amount of sodium that is required to be present at these particular channels are uh, required to be higher for a migraine brain, primarily because, um, and I don't want to get into too much detail, <clears throat> excuse me, but we have sensory neurons, right? The eyes, the nose, ears. And so we hear, see, smell. Um, for a migrainer in the brain, there are more connections between these neurons. It's a different brain from a standard non-migraine brain. And so if you have more connections in the brain, you have to generate more energy, more electricity to for the communication. So it needs more sodium to start with. And so it isn't that the person is eating a low sodium diet necessarily, which is what most people think I'm eating enough salt. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that as a person with a migraine, you have a different brain and you need a different amount of salt. And that's so our diet today with high carbohydrate, <clears throat> excuse me, with high carbohydrates in a diet, uh, when glucose enters the cells, it actually removes sodium from the cells. And so that causes then a sort of kind of chain reaction. 
So that was actually what I was moving on to next was to talk about the link between, because we're talking about therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. So we're obviously looking at controlling the insulin and bringing down that insulin. So how is a migraine brain linked to hyperinsulinemia or how do, how do the, is the disease process worsened rather by hyperinsulinemia? Okay, so the hyperinsulinemia has two factors. One of them is, of course, the high insulin, but the other, of course, is the high glucose. And in between, there are a lot of glucose sugar crashes, for example, that could be uh, too high glucose, next minute too low glucose, and of course, the insulin variability. But these all affect the sodium channels in the brain. And the connection is uh, primarily is that in order for the glucose to enter the cells, uh, sodium is a, a transporter for glucose into the cells, particularly in the brain. And as a result, if we are eating glucose and sodium has to transport the glucose into the brain cells, then sodium has to leave. It's just a physiological property of the cell of how glucose enters. And if the sodium left the cell, then it cannot work anymore to create the electricity. And so if you reduce our glucose or sodium or um, uh, sugar consumption and carbohydrates in general, then there won't be so much glucose that needs to enter into the brain cells and thereby we are not reducing the sodium so much. And so there's a very direct connection which lies behind the medicine-free uh, prevention of migraine <clears throat> in that it uses the approach of not eating sugar, then you're not gonna lose so much salt and then you don't have to replace them. Maybe you still need more salt because the brain is different, but a different way of approach. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, I'm going to come to you now, uh, Laurie. You deal with a, a chapter that, or a section in the chapter that is, um, you know, for those who've experienced a traumatic brain injury and for the doctors treating it, you're really treating the, the family because you have to also support um, that family around the patient. And it's a long process. Um, you really have no idea where you're going. It's a wait and see um, kind of picture. And you, uh, you, you, you touched on that. Um, as a survivor of traumatic brain injury. So I wanted to ask you if you could start by sharing briefly your story um, and then um, just talking about this hypermetabolic state that the brain is in when the, the person is healing from this traumatic brain injury, which is, it, it, it's, over, it's, it's over a long period of time, this healing. So could you start by sharing, Laurie, and then going into uh, the me mechanics um, that's going on in the brain? Energy yeah, mechanics. sure, thanks very much. Um, I'm glad I'm following off to Angela because I mean, the biggest problem I had, well, the problem is I had a splitting headache for 13 months, you know, this no relief, it was just, yeah, so, I mean, I was hit by a truck. So the first thing you was a whiplash. My, my, my neck sort of whipped back and I broke to my vertebrae my, my, my neck. And I went over the handlebars and fell on my head at about 100 kilometers an hour. That's probably like 60 miles an hour. It hit, hit the tarmac. And my brain went like this inside my skull, backwards and forwards and shearing damage and swelling. And so it was a very severe traumatic brain injury because I was in a coma for five days. And I got total memory loss for like 36 days. And then for, for, for a month after, it's like sketchy memory. Um, and I was actually like thinking back of the, the time, sort of the biggest issues I had in this. The, the first one was the, just the sheer trauma in the head, the headache for 13 months. And then after that, it's every time I exerted myself. So literally, I just do a menial thing, like just even putting the bath water in, my head starts pounding. So anytime you exert yourself, it's like, tickets so you've got to pace yourself the other thing was the debilitating fatigue and i had a lot of injuries but i think also because we I mean, with tim noakes with a lot of um prof noakes the central governor so if your brain is injured it measures the amount of work you can do so you always got to balance how much you can do and your brain will shut you down if you try and do too much and typical me i mean i'm a cyclist and the exercise freaks are try to get back my bike, but I just get sick immediately if I started cycling. So, so that was the fatigue was a big thing. But the most, most overwhelming thing of all was the stress involved. It's like you've got a brain injury, 
that you're doing something that you normally could easily do, but now your brain is doing it differently. And a simple thing like walking through a door, just like I, I just, it was so difficult to place myself in space. So you walk into the door frame because now you can't, but your brain's not balancing, you're putting you in, in, properly in space. And that's actually drove my research. So, and I just want to briefly mention the headache because that was like a big thing, but I actually narrowed it down to, because when I was in the hospital, I got so much drugs and chemicals and they pump stuff into me all the time. And my biggest concern was getting off the drug as quickly as possible, but still I was on so many tablets. And I think it was the detoxing effect that was the biggest problem. It's like trying to get rid of all the stuff out of your body. And I actually went on a diet, I mean, a fast, like three day fast. And because I'm a cyclist, I always used to have a high carbohydrate diet. And that's actually our cotton on. So like I'm gonna cut out sugar, cut out bread, cut out pasta, all simple sugars, like cool drinks and stuff I used to drink all the time. Because I just felt that was like making me tired for some reason. And I wanted to get back to my research. And it was amazing because I was doing a month of a detox and just cutting out those simple sugars and, and even stuff like um, even milk. I mean, of course, I, I figured out it was lactose intolerance. So I made sure all the stuff that wasn't agreeing with me, all tablets, everything that was not, and uh, preservatives in the food, and too much processing, all of that I cut out and then I, I bounced back and it was amazing. Like after just a couple of months of doing that, I could start my research, my postdoc research. And then I went into doing stress, you know, looking at how to manage bodily stress reactivity. And I think especially for brain injury, that's a big part of the healing is if you can get your autonomic nervous system balanced again, because you mentioned that like the hypermetabolic state, because extreme amount of stress just fire, fires your fight or flight system and the sympathetic nervous system is overactive your adrenaline is, is going everywhere you re release so much sugar into the blood that your brain just gets all this glucose and the insulin is a problem and it just it's a, yeah it's, it's a, so that to me was what I, I focused completely on on the stress you know working with the energy and the, sorry the stress in my body and to balance the stress properly and it, it, it goes from cellular level if you Look at the reactive oxygen species inside your cell. Like anytime we need energy, it's, it's in effect that's stress. You know, to, to produce energy in the body is going to produce stress in your body. So it's just a matter of balancing that out. And I found with cutting out carbohydrates, the simple, especially simple sugars, helped a lot to like take that trauma away from the cell. At least you don't have so much insulin release. And, and the other big thing is that if you've got too much adrenaline release, it almost like counters your insulin. So it, it knocks, it actually like sort of a sympathetic response will block your insulin. So it's like almost make you more insulin resistant. So I found when I was, did this um, managing my sympathetic nervous system, it cut back on, you know, it actually brought my insulin sensitivity back. And the other thing is also your, it's not just your, your, um, your, your, your adrenaline, it's also your vagus nerve very important and the most important is obviously your gut brain so if you can get that firing again your gut brain correct because i think that's that's one of the biggest problems with brain injuries because of the brain derangement and your autonomic nervous system sort of dysregulation your your gut brain just your gut just implodes you know all the regulation happening there and in the book we made a table there with, with julianne the doctor i was working with it's she's more more in favor with the diet are more related to the stress in the body um, and particular things like your visceral stress and they, they I think are specifically the liver because if you don't have proper liver activation you're going to either produce you know kick out glucose too much glucose even gluconeogenesis you've got to manage that with the vagal nerve you got to you manage your your gluconeogenesis you want to use the glucose you eat must get used up you don't want to produce your own glucose at all so, and, and, and that's sort of the, also the pancreas and the spleen, even like the visceral, deep visceral fats, all that has to do with your autonomic nervous system. So that, that sort of was our main focus. Also, I, I, this, the chapters aren't very long, but I tried to put in a bit about the, the autonomic dysfunction and, the, and, and especially the diet, you know, so just the table there to clarify what, what the good, what, what is like nutritious food to eat for, for the brain. When, you, when the brain is in with yeah, met met metabolic issues. Your um, section should actually be a book on itself because I think what you're describing is all of the all of the different um, sort of factors that have an impact on keeping glucose low 
and bring keeping insulin low. So all of the things that you've mentioned, the autonomic nervous system and, you know, the role of the gut and, you know, so especially what you said about too much sugar drives oh, yeah. um, the mitochondria. And normally we would put out about 5% of reactive oxygen species. But when you're pumping more sugar down that pathway, not only are you pushing up your reactive oxygen species, you're also using up your, your potent, your, your main antioxidant glutathione. So, uh, you know, so you, you actually describe so much that you, you, you need to uh, extrapolate um, further for people who are interested. Um, but what I also wanted to ask you about, Laurie, is you mentioned, you know, one of the studies that I think most doctors know about, which is the to, to keep in a traumatic brain injury patient to try to keep the blood sugar between four and eight. And for myself running a high care unit, I actually backed onto the trauma. Mine was a medical high care unit. And, you know, that was where that is followed to the T, but not on the medical side. Talk a little bit about the role. And I'm going to start coming around now talking about the therapeutic role um, of um, a ketogenic or ca carbohydrate uh, restricted diet um, in the healing compared to um, in, a, in a hospital setting, trying to keep that sugar between four and eight uh, with using insulin and then infusions and all of that versus using a ketogenic diet. How is the ketogenic diet more helpful? Uh, There's no comparison because, I mean, we've done exercise studies where we actually try and keep the blood loop at a certain level. And you've literally got to take a sample every like every minute almost. Okay, we did it closely controlled, but it's very, very difficult to maintain. And the insulin level has got to change. It's just that the sort of the sort of the management becomes unmanageable, you know, if you want to do it properly. Whereas a ketogenic diet, once it's you know in a ketotic state, it's like this takes care of your energy because your brain can use the, the ketones, it doesn't need as much glucose, and it just makes things much simpler. So it's like, a, it's almost like a no-brainer, if I can say it like that, but it's, yeah, it just makes it so much simpler not to have to worry, you know, that it's going to be too much glucose or too little. Absolutely. And when you're dealing with, um, in the clinical setting, in, in the hospital setting, when you're dealing with a patient, you have so many other factors to consider, mm -hmm. whether yeah. it's sepsis or other forms of stress that's pushing, pushing the sugar high and then giving the insulin and then the, the sugar comes crashing down that this just makes so much more sense but of course um i'll start with uh, amy and, and georgia in the case of alzheimer's patient and georgia you spoke about that already saying that once your patient has established alzheimer's disease to start that uh, protocol of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction and try and keep the ketones up and all of that you Obviously, for anybody who has had a parent or a family member with Alzheimer's will understand how absolutely difficult it is completely on the family that they are there are support structures for the for the carers um, and the carers, are, uh, you know, you, you, you want to support them um, through this very difficult diagnosis. Um, and having uh, friends and colleagues myself with uh, patients like this and working in the unit myself to implement this um, diet in a patient with established Alzheimer's disease, can you talk about the complications, the difficulties, and of course then why it's so important that we start earlier with prevention? So um, Amy, would you wanna start? Uh, sure, so um, you, you explained it so well. I mean, for, even for someone who's young and in excellent health, it can be difficult to adhere to a true ketogenic diet. Now, now factor in someone who's impaired or who's elderly and um, has been eating a certain way for 50, 60, 80 years. <laughs> so it's not always, and, and you know, in the end stages, they can be belligerent. So it's definitely not easy to have them adhere to a ketogenic diet. And I think this, this is where, the exogenous ketones or MCT oil, while I think most of us here would agree that we would not recommend that for weight loss or reversing type two diabetes or those things in a neurological type situation, at least Alzheimer's and potentially Parkinson's and some other neurodegenerative conditions, these exogenous ketones can be helpful because again, if the major problem is that the brain is not getting enough fuel, 
and we know for certain that the, sh the fuel shortage is specific to glucose, the Alzheimer's brain does still take up and metabolize ketones. So we want to give this starving brain ketones any way we can. Ideally, we would do that with a ketogenic diet, um, but in people who can't or won't stick to a ketogenic diet, I think those other um, methods of raising ketones can be helpful. But the, the problem, of course, is that if insulin resistance and, and hyperglycemia and all of these metabolic type things are contributing to the problem, the exogenous ketones don't do anything to address, like Georgia was saying, those root causes. It's, it's only correcting the symptom in short term, whereas a ketogenic diet in theory would go some length toward correcting the underlying metabolic problem. But again, in someone who's more elderly or whose disease is more advanced, I don't, we do not have research yet to indicate that you can really make a big dent. I, I do think that you can still improve that person's quality of life and their caregiver's quality of life in whatever time they have left. So, I mean, I, ideally you do the diet, but if you can't, I, I think there's a role for those exogenous ketones. Thanks so much, Amy. Georgia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so just, um, you know, I have, a, I have a general psychiatry practice. I see patients with all different types of um, psychiatric conditions, including Alzheimer's. And uh, as time has gone on, I mean, there, there are some cases described in the textbook, which I would really uh, recommend that people read and, and study and learn from. But a couple of recent examples from, from my practice, which go to your question about, you know, how, how difficult this can be, what some of the challenges can be in terms of, you know, trying to learn a new way of eating, as Amy was saying, trying to learn a new way of eating later in life, regardless of whether you have a cognitive impairment or not, is a huge challenge and behavior change in general, huge challenge. So, uh, but, but it is possible even in people with mild cognitive impairment, uh, sort of pre Alzheimer's disease, if you will, or early Alzheimer's disease. If you have a very motivated patient who has um, supportive uh, people around them who are willing to help mm -hmm. them. And if you're willing to put in the time to, to you know, to really uh, work closely with that person, it definitely uh, can be done. It's much, much better uh, prevention. In when it comes to Alzheimer's, prevention is much, much more powerful than, than cure. And that's what we should be focused on, which means we all need to be given better information about how to take care of our brains throughout our entire life, rather than waiting until the last minute when things have already gone downhill so much. But the wonderful thing about ketogenic diets um, is that even I've seen this myself, even in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease, if you have a motivated patient with all the, the pieces in place um, in terms of clinicians and caregivers, um, you can see really amazing improvements. And so one, one uh, gentleman I worked with in his 80s with early Alzheimer's disease, very motivated family around him, uh, who some of whom were following a ketogenic diet themselves for other reasons, um, was able to stick with a, a truly ketogenic diet, meaning uh, you're measuring ketones and you're seeing ketones in a therapeutic range um, rather than just a simple low carbohydrate diet. Definitely, the, every family member agreed that on the days when he was following that diet, he was mentally sharper, he his mood was better, um, and he was much more optimistic and it just just much clearer. And and he agreed with that. <laughs> all that diet for more than two years. And then uh, a woman I was recently working with who had um, had a head injury, traumatic brain injury about 20 years before had been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and uh, some seizures as a result of that head injury. And so for 20 years, she lived with mild cognitive impairment. But then when she was kind of rounding the corner into her sixties, that impairment started to worsen. And uh, so she became really concerned. Uh, she, uh, she, for example, she was sitting down to use the sewing machine that she had used every day for 50 years and couldn't remember how to thread the machine. She mm. was terrified, right? And so this was the, she, she knew something was, was worse than usual. She goes to her primary care doctor, the primary care doctor says, oh, you, you know, gives her some cognitive testing says, oh, you have Alzheimer's disease go home and live, live your life. There's nothing, nothing we can do. 
and says, I, I'll, I'll get you an appointment with a neurologist for 10 weeks from now, which is the earliest appointment. Just go home and wait for that appointment. So she got in touch with me and, and I said, I said, read Amy Berger's book, The Alzheimer's Antidote, try a ketogenic diet, see if, what, if it might be able to help you. She followed it to the letter. She got her ketones into a therapeutic range with the help of her son who also follows a ketogenic diet. And by the time she got to the neurology appointment, he said, you don't even have mild cognitive impairment. Like your, your test is normal. And so within 10 weeks. And so when under the right circumstances, if there's still a lot of hope and empowering information. I mean, these diets are really powerful metabolic interventions. They're very powerful, more powerful than we have no drug that can do this. We don't have a drug that can come anywhere close to that kind of recovery from long-term cognitive impairment. So it is possible, but it is much, much better not to wait until, until that point, because the majority of patients I talk to about blood glucose and insulin and brain sugar and all of these different things that, that can lead to cognitive decline, if they have cognitive decline, the majority of them will not or cannot change their diet. And uh, so I think that, I mean, that's partly because of addiction to, to sugary foods, and partly because um, there's already enough cognitive impairment that the, really the creatures of routine and habit, it's really, really difficult to change behavior. As Amy was saying, uh, um, th th these are, you get set in your ways, and we have to have extra conversations, repeated conversations about, no, we're not counting calories, we're counting carbohydrates. Oh, what's the difference again? No, we're not counting calories, we're counting carbohydrates. So it's just much harder to learn a new way of eating if you're having learning difficulties. Oh, can I um, can I just add something? Add something real quick to that. I'm um first of all, I'm honored to hear that about my book. Thank you. And you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, if there was a drug that could do what the ketogenic diet does, nobody would be able to afford it anyway because it would be a jillion dollars because of of how amazingly powerful this is. But what I wanted to add, like, again, to offer hope, like Georgia was saying, it, it can be difficult for somebody with some kind of impairment to do a ketogenic diet. And they absolutely need that family support, support from their friends, whoever. The thing is, chances are somebody else in that family or multiple people in that family could benefit from a keto diet for their own reasons. Yes. Chances are somebody in that family has obesity, has type two diabetes, has migraines, has, um, you know, gout, hypertension, fatty liver. So it's, it, it's not like, oh, mom has to do this special diet. Granddad has to do this special diet. No, the whole, it, it's just a healthy way to eat. Everyone in the family can do this, whether or not they have medical issues. And, and chances are some of them probably do. I mean, that's, most people are not healthy anymore. So chances are the whole family could benefit anyway. And it's not just that the whole family has to rearrange their life for grandma. You know, I love what both of you have said. And as a as a physician, my favorite patients are the older patients. And I think that the way um, we live our lives now, um, previously, older people were held in high esteem for their life experience and their wisdom and their knowledge. And with this, just this epidemic of Alzheimer's, we're losing that ability for the granny and the grandfather to be able to speak spend this type of quality time and learn. Um, and as you say, Amy, so rightfully, you know, the, the chances are that most of the people actually in that family would benefit, um, you know, so, so that is why it's so important because imagine with the childhood, um, the epidemic of childhood obesity, even if those children survive um, adulthood, what's going to happen if you look at root cause? So it's so important um, that we, we talk about this more, that we understand this more, because it is actually devastating for just the whole the world, just globally, 
in every facet that you can imagine, um, economically, health-wise, you know, we're going downhill until unless we take this seriously and start now. Um, Angela um, and and Laurie, we don't have much time, but I'm going to start with you, Angela. So important, migraine. People think they're actually hopeless because there is a particular pull. That pull sort of works sometimes, and then it doesn't work. And what am I going to do? How difficult it is, is it with using the therapeutic carbohydrate restriction and then, um, you know, talking to people about monitoring their sodium? And I know you have tests that you um, you help people with. How, how difficult is it to get people or are people more easily won over when, when they understand the reason for migraine? Well, it has two sides to it. And as Amy said, earlier, the family support is the most important, but it's also important to note that migraine is genetic. And just like Alzheimer's or anything else, if one person has it in the family, there's a very good chance that the children will have it. Maybe not the spouse, but the children and maybe the parents. Uh, and so it, it is uh, limiting in that some people simply are unable to apply to the family and aren't getting any support from the family. Um, particularly culturally, it can be very difficult for some people who have to follow certain religious or cultural ways and they can't uh, move away from uh, what the family eats. And then it becomes very constricted. But um, I'm saying the same thing to all my migraineurs as Amy does, is that if you have migraines, uh, why not change your diet for the whole family? Why just you? There's nothing wrong with a child also not eating sugar they don't need the sugar anymore than you do. And in fact, they would be healthier if they don't. And I have many pregnant women, for example, nursing women tell me, well, but I'm told I need to eat all the sugar. And so I can't go without the carbohydrates, but actually you don't need all the sugar. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to see that. Um, and now we understand that, for example, colic uh, supposedly is a migraine presentation in the infant. And I had um, a mom, who had a, an infant who was crying continuously all the time, but she was a vegetarian and she, to the point that she refused to eat fish and, and uh, I think eggs as well, but maybe had dairy, I don't remember. And I begged her to just eat a little fish, please, because the, the brain of the baby needs the DHA, the fatty acid that is coming from the fish and she can't provide it in any other way from her food. And so finally she gave him one night and she ate some salmon, I believe. And she said, wow, that was the first night her baby slept. And so it is so important, uh, not just in the prevention of Alzheimer's or migraine and other things, but as a whole concept for the whole body. And once I am able to convince the people to do that, it's still not easy. Now with migraine, I have to say though, they have an immediate feedback because if you don't follow the diet, you will be getting a massive headache. Mm -hmm. And you will be vomiting and you're going to have all kinds of syndromes. Uh, it could be uh, vertigo, whatever else, really unpleasant and impossible to live with. And so there is a mechanism that tells you you were bad. You need to really follow that diet. So it makes it easier because of the feedback. But it's very difficult for the family members in the support group. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, Laurie, I know you don't work in the clinical setting, but when it comes to um, the, you know, prescribing these these uh, the therapy, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction to somebody with traumatic brain injury, obviously that in hospital setting is so important, and we don't have it yet. Um, do you have any any comments to make about that? Well, I think the most important thing is to get your your gut brain activated again because I said I think that's the biggest my secondary injury okay the primary injury that uh, Julianne Fenwick my partner sort of for the, for the other part of the chapter she she specialized in, in traumatic brain injury in the hospital setting I'm more so the secondary injuries and but, but she, her point was that the gut is extremely important and for that you need to have proper autonomic balance um, but the other thing I would also I didn't mention before is the is actually that the, to quieten your thinking because that's the other big problem. You know, if you overanalyze things in your brain, that's almost like overrides your hypothalamus. So it's like the busy brain is like a big thing, which I taught myself, you know, to stop thinking, overthinking things. And so, I mean, I don't promote any drugs, but the one thing I would promote is tranquilizer, because I think if you just 
your head is too busy and things are like too pear shaped just to settle everything down just to take a tranquilizer but so so in the, for me it would be like just to learn how to quieten your thinking and to um yeah just to, to learn how to breathe to breathe deeply from you know sort of that sort of diaphragmatic breathing activate your vagal nerve to get your gut brain back and then obviously the food is very important what i did is i cut out sugars i'll have like sort of i mean very very key is like what um angel also mentioned is like you know the omega-3s you know you can get like that from sardines uh, like atlantic mackerel salmon very good and flaxseed also um so that's uh, just a very simple sort of strategies Thank you so much. Um, so to end, we've been talking about therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. What a, a term it really translates into real food. And we've been talking about things like, you know, everybody should be able to do well without sugar. Well, I've got two children um, and in our family, we don't eat any sugar. My children eat what I eat. So this therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is how I think we we all all eat, limiting the processed foods and things like that. So in closing, can you, I'll start, each of us say what, just to demystify it, for somebody who doesn't know what therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is, of course, I'm simplifying it because we're, I'm not talking about people who have to monitor ketones, but just in terms of what the food is, maybe just say what's usually in your pantry and in your freezer so people realize what therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is. I'll start. Eggs, steak, fish. Um, Georgia. Uh, salmon, lamb, tuna, um, and a, a few low carbohydrate non-starchy vegetables. Mm -hmm. Amy. Yes, same. Lots of uh, pork, beef, uh, poultry, seafood. I do a lot of broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cruciferous vegetables, mushrooms, and, and eggs, like you said. Awesome. Angela? I don't have any vegetables in anywhere. I don't actually even have anything in the pantry other than salt and maybe some spices. So I will go for, uh, in fact, three freezers full of beef, <laughs> some chicken, <laughs> some pork, but it's mostly beef and the very unusual cuts and marrow. You're going to find a lot of bone marrow everywhere and broth and these kind of things. So I'm a beef person. Awesome. Thanks. And Laurie? Well, I love nuts and seeds, sprouts, uh, beans. That's sort of what I'll focus on. Yeah. And also, I mean, I love chicken and, and uh, like a good steak. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, I wish I had, honestly, you know, people say this, but I really wish I had more time because I could sit here and talk and talk and talk, but your time is precious. And so is the time of our viewers. And thank you all so much for joining us. I hope that everybody who's watching will get the textbook, um, you know, buy it for your doctor or let your doctor know or read it for yourself and just prevent let's 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 be more intelligent in the way in which we're living let us not look at these diseases and you know 50 years from now let's be the reason why people say do you know how they used to treat alzheimer's before let's do better from here on thank you so much to all of you um and thanks to all of you who are watching us for joining us bye thank you thank you bye. thank you